Okay, as the music fades away, uh, welcome to the eighth in our series of revision live streams for paper two. And huge thanks for those of you joining us live this evening. If you're watching uh, live, keep an eye on the chat, which is amazing. We have the most incredibly talented group of economists who are going to, uh, going to do really well tomorrow. Whatever's thrown at you, just stay calm, stay positive, stay focused, and you'll be fine. What I thought I'd do in this session was just do a little bit of a warm up, and in particular, look at four key quantitative skills. So you've got a chance to practice that. You might well have uh, find it useful to have a, a calculator or some other calculating instrument to hand. Uh, we'll do a bit, a bit of a bubble quiz, uh, a little look at the diagrams, the key diagrams that might well be worth looking at this evening, ahead of your macro paper. Don't forget you've got tomorrow morning to, to fine tune your revision. And then I'll have uh, leave a little bit of time, two or three minutes for some final questions at the end. But the aim is to, to cover this in, in sort of 20, 25 minutes. Okay, let's make a start. Here we go. Here's a bubble quiz. We like a bubble quiz. I wish it was on the exam. That's all I'm saying. So the number of answers, those of you who've done these before, you'll know this, but uh, we give you a question and the number of answers that could be correct could range from zero, they could all be wrong, to all four could be right. And the idea in the chat window is to choose the letters you think are the correct answers. I've got three of them, I think, for you, maybe four. Here we go. Which of these countries have a lower unemployment rate than the UK as of April 2022. What do we think here? I'll give a shout out to be able to get the correct answer. Which of these countries have a lower unemployment rate than the UK? Seb thinks it's A and B. Interesting. Olivia thinks it's A and C. Uh, Izzy thinks it's B, C, D. Uh, Chloe is confident on D. Lower unemployment than the UK. Um, then we get unemployment in the UK is 3.7%. By the way, if I'm looking a little bit to my right here, it's because I'm just trying to keep an eye on the chat uh, as it comes through. Uh, our man thinks ACD, ACD, interesting. And okay, Barry's Tech, DNA. Not DNA, but D and A. 
Uh, okay, Ben Squatts thinks A and C, and Shemail thinks A and C as well. Tom Brown thinks A, B, C. And one more uh, coming through, lots of coming, wow, amazing numbers coming through. Uh, Bassan thinks A and C. Here we go, here's the answers. It's A, C, D, and quite a few of you got the right answers there. Well done if you did. German unemployment is actually 5%. If you want to jot this down, you can plummet 3.7%. German unemployment is higher, it's 5%. Singapore, South Korea, Mexico all have very, very low unemployment. Keep in mind, though, for evaluation that in Mexico, there's a lot of informal economic activity. The informal sector is probably about 60% of GDP, and therefore there's probably a lot of hidden unemployment. But Singapore, South Korea, good examples of countries with unemployment of less than 3%. Well done. Here's number two. Which of these nations in 2021 run a trade surplus a trade surplus of more than five percent of gdp now i'm conscious that not every board has balance of payments on their advanced information specification but trade surplus is still part of aggregate demand isn't it so which of these nations do you think run a trade surplus of more than five percent of their national income in 2021 the countries i've chosen are netherlands united states turkey and singapore what do we think on this one jacob thinks d Finn thinks D. Can we agree on this one? Uh, Luke thinks ABC. Luke Ellis thinks ABC. Uh, Rachel, Rachel Harris thinks A and D. Abraham says B and D. Okay. And Jamie McStavrick says A and D as well. <clears throat> so, two days, uh, what I want to people coming through here. What people saying ABC. And one more coming through. Let me pick out one more. Okay. Noah thinks A and C. Here's the right answer. Netherlands and Singapore. Netherlands and Singapore. Singapore's trade surplus, something like 17% of GDP in 2021. Do you remember that uh, session we did on trade and globalization? I picked out Singapore as a country, one of those kind of amazing hub economies in the world economy. Trade is 370% of GDP, and they run a trade surplus of about 17% of GDP. The Dutch, very, very strong trade surplus. Turkey, United States, no, they run a trade deficit. Here's our third, our third uh, question. Which of these countries has a youth unemployment rate above 40%? Youth unemployment, really key. Uh, youth people in the age between 18, 16 and 24 or 18 and 24, but people, young, young workers. Um, what do we think on this one? I'll pick out some answers here. Um, Solly says A. Matilda says D. Don't forget, this is, I've, I've chosen a high benchmark here, haven't I? 40%. Which of these countries have youth unemployment above 40%? Noah says C and D. Gina agrees. She says C and D. And Jezza says A and D. Uh, Oliver Clayton says C and D. Now, I think we're agreed here that all of these four countries have very high youth unemployment, but which of them above 40%? Matthew Dayton, one of our great contributors, has been thinking with this every session. He thinks C and D. Holly thinks B, C, D. That's interesting. Spain and Greece. Here's the answer. It is South Africa, Nigeria. Holly was very close. Greece and Spain have youth unemployment of about 30 to 35 percent. I mean, very high. South Africa, youth unemployment is 65 percent. Nigeria, above 50 percent. Staggeringly high numbers. Great context if you get a question on uh, the impact of unemployment on different parts of the population. I think I've got one more, actually. Let's try this one. Yes. Which of these EU countries has a higher corporation tax rate than the UK. Which of these EU countries, and they all they are all inside the EU, last time I looked, which of them have a higher corporation tax rate than the UK? Quite important, this question, because obviously corporation tax, a big part of fiscal policy, globalization, uh, macro policies at a global level, etc. Uh, Hannah thinks C and D, um, other people coming through. Samuel thinks A and D. And Jay Cartwright, one of our great contributors, thinks A and D. 
higher corporation tax than the UK. Uh, well done. Tom Street agrees. A and D. Michael says that Jeff has a trade surplus. That was the previous question, I think, Michael. We've moved on. Uh, okay. Uh, somebody saying, are we, not, are we meant to know real world stats? Well, the answer is, I think, yes, actually. It's good to know stuff, isn't it? Some of you people will be amazing in a pub quiz. Uh, and, okay, well, let's go for the answers. It's only, yeah, it's three of them. Germany, Spain, and France. They all have a higher corporation tax at the moment, of course. Don't forget that the UK is scheduled to increase corporation tax from 19% at the moment to 25% starting next year but over a phase period they're going to raise corporation tax on big companies companies that make profits of more than a quarter of a million pounds ireland's corporation tax if you want to note this is 12.5 percent now that's below it's the lowest of, of the leading countries by some distance it's below the 15 percent that they've kind of agreed will be the minimum corporation tax rate in 2024 although that itself may not happen well done on the bubble quiz what I thought I'd do very quickly with you, and this is where you might need a calculating implement, is take you through some quantitative skills. Now, don't be afraid of these, but I'm just trying to choose four different skills that might well be tested, maybe short answers, early parts of data response questions, four quantitative skills that the exam board have said will be tested, or as they're on the advanced information. So let's try these. If you're watching on replay, it's a good idea when I show the show the question, just to press the pause button, have a go at the question, and then we'll go through the answer. Here, there's no tap, there's no countdown clock. I'll just give you a 30 seconds or a minute or so to have a go. Uh, the key skills, always write down a formula. If there's a formula you need to use, put it down. You get a, you get a credit for that. Show you're working. Because if you get if you make a mistake and it happens in the exam, you'll get some credit. Be precise. So look to see how how many decimal places, for example, you need to use. And also include the units, and if needed, the sign of the change. One important. Let's have a go. I've got four for you. So if you have a calculator, let's see who's quick and accurate on these questions. First one, median and mean. AQA, by the way, stating this is a key quantitative skill for your paper. Median household disposable income in the UK was 31,385 last year. Mean was 37,622. Wow, big difference. Calculate the ratio of mean to median income to two decimal places. So have a go at that, please. Interesting, this one. Big gap, big gap between mean and median in the UK. Disposable income, of course, is income after direct taxes and welfare benefits. And we're going to keep an eye on the chat window. People are still getting uh, bubble quiz answers coming through, but that will change in a second. So many people answering. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, maybe in the production team, if they spot any ratios coming through, they will put them up on the screen. Calculate the ratio of mean to median income to two decimal places. I'll also pose a little extra question here. Why is the mean in the UK so much higher than the median. It's a really quite important bit of information, bit of economic data there, which is a good one. Uh, okay. Are we getting any answers coming through? I'm sure they will do in a few seconds, so let's be patient. Ah, Rachel's gone 1 to 1.2. Dom, 1.2. Becca, 1 to 1.2. Ah, interesting, interesting answers. Keep in mind, everybody, the question is saying, Calculate the ratio of mean to median, not median to mean. Okay, mean to median. I actually put the data the other way around. Harris 1.2 to 1. Excellent. Yeah, let's have a look at the answer then. Alex has got it right as well. Bought to read the question. Calculate the ratio of mean to median. Although I gave you the data in the other, the other order. So it's 37.67622 divided by 31.385, which gives a ratio of 1.2 to 1.0. Now, if you put 1.2, you get a credit, clearly. If it was three marks, you'd have to put the ratio in to the answer. Uh, just very quickly, can somebody post in chat, maybe? Why is the mean disposable income in the UK over £6,000 higher than the median? What do we think for that? Why is mean so much higher than median. Uh, 
is big wings. It's because the median is the middle in the data and mean is the total income divided by the number of households. Mean creates a negative skew. I could not improve that answer. Of course, the, the, the pay of people at the top, the top two, top 1% in particular, drives the mean up. It's the old thing, isn't it? If Jeff Bezos, another amazing guy called Jeff, if Jeff Bezos got onto a bus in a poor neighborhood of my hometown, my hometown of in Yorkshire, everybody on the bus on average would be billionaires for the time that Jeff was on the bus. Once he gets off the bus, uh, people become poorer on average. Let's look at the second one. Here we go. Second skill coming up. Uh, this time calculating percentage changes. You will probably have to calculate percentage change at least one tomorrow. In 2019, the UK government ran a fiscal deficit of £55 billion. In 2020, the fiscal deficit increased to £318 billion. Now we can nitpick the figures. Some people want to that's what happened. Calculate to one decimal place the percentage change in the fiscal deficit between 2019 and 2020. Have you got this one, please? What was the percentage change in the fiscal deficit between 2019 and 2020? We have nearly 1,200 people in the chat at the moment in the, in the live stream. Welcome to you, by the way. And uh, Jim in the production office is uh, doing a great job of picking out some of the answers as they come through. So thank you for that. M, uh, yep, good, Archie. And yep, I think M was brilliant. She put the plus in. The sign can be important. So just to be a little bit pedantic, try and put the plus in. It is a plus. 478.2. Ella, well done on that. Here's the answer coming through. And a bit of the working. Then we've got percentage changes. The change divided by the original times by 100. So the original was 55. So you've got from 55 to 318. Then work out that change. Divide by 55, multiply by 100, plus 478.2%. Tiny, tiny example. It's but worth emphasizing, isn't it? Plus and put the percent in. And do what it says on the tip, okay? And it's to one decimal place. Well done on that. Here's our third quantitative skill. Now, this is a harder one. So, again, don't worry. If you're a little flaky on these, I think we're going to be putting up some, um, we've got some lovely little short videos on quantitative skills. We're going to find a few of these, maybe tonight and put them up for you. If you're a little bit flaky, worth practicing tomorrow. Uh, this is about calculating an index number. Here we go. The average UK house price in 2021 was 271,000, which is 25,000 higher than in 2020. Okay. Using this data, construct a house price index for two years, 2020 and 21, 2020, 2021, with 2020 as your base year for the index. Three marks here. So take a moment on this, don't, don't panic. We'll go through the answer together. If you're working, watching live, have a go. And if you're playing catch up here, watching this after the event, first of all, welcome. And just press the pause button and have a go at this question. So house prices were 25,000 higher in 2021 than the year before. So that allows you to work out what the house price was in 2020, doesn't it? Using this data, construct a house price index for two years. 2020 is your base year. That will always have one, an index number of a particular type. What was the index in 2021? So Jay's come in with his number for, I think, 2021 there. Okay. Yeah, ah, good. There's an answer which shows the two years. You have to construct the input for two separate years, and that's, that's really well done. Okay. And Archie has just shown the one index. Likewise, George, but we're looking for two. Voda23 has done a good job there. By the way, it doesn't say DP there, doesn't it? So don't worry about it. You, normally, it's one decimal place with an index number. Bob Horner's got the right answer. Let's double check them. Let's just work through the explanation together. So the house price index, uh, first of all, you, you should you, make, you can calculate the house prices in 2020. It must have been 246,000. You take off 25,000 from 271. That becomes your base year. So the base year index is always 100. Uh, and then you express house prices in 2021, 271 divided by 246 times 100. So you take your base level. Yeah, okay. 110.2 to, to one decimal place. 
Well done. And one more. One more. <laughs> okay. Now, this, I've got two questions here. On April the 6th, the rates of national insurance, NICs, paid by employees in the UK rose from 12% to 13.25%. Two questions. One's a one marker. One's a two marker. What is this as a percentage point change? AQA are saying that is one of the key quantitative skills for their exam. What is this as a percentage point change? And what will be the percentage rise in national insurance that employees will pay? In other words, what is it as a percentage change? Okay, so having got these ones, uh, and there's often some confusion here. People, if it says percentage point change, it's not the same as percentage change, hence the reason for asking this question. So what's the percentage point change? And what is the percentage change? So obviously an increase has gone up in national insurance. Okay, let's see if answers are coming through. Hannah's gone for 1.25 percentage points and 10.4%. Let's take a couple more coming through. Henry East, so it's a 1.25 percentage point change. Ah, okay, the point change is 1.25%. Yes, the percentage point change. Good. I think Matilda's expressed that beautifully there. Roger's got it. Here, here's the answer. Uh, first one, it is a one, and this is how you need to uh, write it out in the exam. It's a 1.25 percentage point change. Okay. And then working on the percentage change, well, it's, the original was 12. It's gone up by 1.25. So it's change over the original times 100. 1.25 divided by 12 times 100 gives plus 10.4%. Plus 10.4%. Well done on those. Uh, quantitative skills, you will get some questions on them. And if you get them right, by the way, you're in great shape because those little marks, they add up in the exam. Uh, you just have to do the little things well in an exam. So say a few things about diagrams for a few minutes, if that's okay with you. Uh, as I said at the micro, Warm up. Examiners are looking for developed diagrams. So, uh, the quality of the diagrams you draw tomorrow in your exam will make a big difference. A lot of people say to me, Yeah, micro, so many more diagrams. It's easier to, it's well, harder diagrams, costumes, revenue, all that kind of stuff. Macro, a bit samey, a bit ADS all the time. There's a bit of, bit of that, but, but you, you've got to use diagrams well in an exam. I'm sure you will. They're good for knowledge. Very good for application because you can adapt them in response to a context. Very important to write about your diagrams in your chains of reasoning. Don't just leave the diagram as separate tomorrow. Build it into your analysis. And actually, you can also use diagrams for evaluation, particularly if you're challenging an assumption made when drawing a diagram. Well, what diagrams are we going to draw tomorrow? Well, I think let's have a little think about what some of the diagrams could come up. And this is not an exclusive list, but it might be worth taking a screenshot and just double checking tonight, maybe tomorrow, that you've got your diagrams to hand. I'm trying to go across boards here, Edexcel, AQA, OCR, WJC. Don't, and here's a, a, a tidy reminder, don't worry about, saying, well, I'm just using ADS analysis, and that's last year's macro. Your macro paper tomorrow covers year one and year two, you know, year 12 economics, year 13 economics. So please do make extensive use of AD aggregate supply, short and long run analysis, especially when you're talking about policies, uh, impact on objectives, and especially if you're talking about things like external shocks, which we mentioned in the previous session, oil prices and gas prices, etc. ADAS analysis is your go-to diagram. So please don't be afraid to use it, it'll, it'll help. Quite a few diagrams to draw on trade. Trade theory diagrams, basically PPF and supply and demand, as far as I can see. Um, it's a bit like saying, you know, well, I, mean, I, I, I don't really like cucumber myself, and cucumber I think is just basically water, as far as I can see. Trade theory diagrams, basically supply and demand, is that it? Uh, PPFs, but, but use them. Trade protectionism, again, supply and demand analysis. They can use them. Import tariffs is the key one, I think. Not, you don't necessarily have to be able to draw a quota diagram, but you should be, certainly be able to use a subsidy diagram in your analysis. Some of you will need a Phillips curve tomorrow uh, and variants of it if you're looking at conflicts between objectives. Not every board has put that on AI. Some of you will need the Laffer curve if you're getting a question on the fiscal policy and tax revenues. 
if you're doing an equality, you should definitely be practicing your lens curve diagram, showing different lens curves for different levels of inequality. And we've had a lot of discussion in the last couple of days about using micro diagrams in macro. You can and should use them if they're relevant. So, for example, labor market diagrams on minimum wage, effects and things, that kind of stuff. Uh, occasionally externalities, if you get a question on living standards and pollution, that kind of stuff. But link the diagrams back to macro in your, in your explanation. Let me just give you two examples of what I think I mean by really developed diagrams. So I've done a session, uh, I think it was session one on globalization and trade last week. And we worked through an example of comparative advantage for two countries, um, Mexico and Brazil, producing steel and wine. And we said, well, you can use PPF diagrams if you want to show trade. And here's an example where Brazil has the absolute advantage, can produce more of both, but Mexico has the relative advantage. Hopefully you get this now in wine. It's much closer, the PPF is much closer to, uh, to Brazil in terms of wine, whereas Brazil's a long way ahead in terms of steel. So Brazil will tend to specialize in steel and Mexico will tend to specialize in wine and there's, there's gains from trade. If you drew this diagram, you would, if we go back a slide, Jim, <laughs> stick to the original diagram, please. Yeah, thank you. This diagram on its own is fine for talking about comparative advantage and possible gains. Okay, it's fine. And you certainly get good credit for it. But to take it to the next level, as uh, fans of Welsh football are celebrating at the moment, to, get, to go to the next level, you probably want to show the gains from trade. And let's move to the next slide. The gains from trade is where a country's consumption possibility frontier can shift out. Uh, the dotted lines, by the way, have the same gradient for Brazil and Mexico. And in theory, they can now consume more of both because they found the terms of trade which benefits both countries. That diagram would be the highest level you'd be expected to possibly draw an A-level if you get a question on gains from trade. Second example I wanted to share with you was tariffs. By the way, just quick advice. Uh, again, always talk about your diagrams in, in the text. So use diagrams to explain the impact of policies, like a tariff, we'll go through in a second. But the impact on who? On consumers. What happens to the real income? What happens to the consumer surplus? On producers, both domestic and importers. On governments, on social on society as a whole, the tariffs benefit societies and inequality, who gains, who loses. So the diagrams are basically a way of supporting your written analysis. So they should be part of the, you know, part of the same process. Let me just give you an example here, looking at tariffs. Uh, by the way, often link the diagram to a particular country. So this is a tariff on steel. It's an import, of, import tariff on steel into Brazil. I don't know. I've got a clue if Brazil makes steel. They probably do. It doesn't bother me if they don't. I just want to use this diagram in the exam. And of course, the tariff increases the price and causes a fall in the volume of imports. If you revise tariffs, there should be a good diagram. That's a perfectly good diagram. And uh, it's a really good diagram. It's well drawn. It's up because I did it nicely drawn, <laughs> um, labeled instead of shaded. And you've shown how a tariff reduces the volume of imports. Fine. To get to the next level, and the next slide helps us, take it a little stage further. So show the uh, the tax revenue, which is area F, G, I, H. For many developing countries, import tariffs are a major source of tax revenues. Show the deadweight welfare loss. By the way, the, the shaded area is the tax revenue. The deadweight welfare loss is not the orange area, but it's E, F, H plus G, D, I. So there's a welfare loss from tariffs. That diagram is very high analysis and it allows you to evaluate some of the consequences of tariffs. So that's, and don't worry if that's, you think, oh, that's way beyond me. You can get a good mark with a, a well-drawn, straightforward diagram. If you want to get to the top level, build, develop your diagram. Talk about tax revenues, talk about welfare losses. And that lifts you to the next level. Okay, that's diagrams. If it's okay with you, just want to spend a couple of minutes, literally a couple of minutes to round off. A reminder, helpful word types, connectives, hedging, evaluative, and structural words. So as, as with the micro paper, build chains of reasoning. That's really key to get top analysis marks. And you can use connective words, therefore, as a result, 
in turn, my favorite, consequently. Use those connective words when you're writing your chains of reasoning. It just helps the exam. Hedging words, instead of will and must, use might sometimes, typically. The different views, different perspectives, a rise in the budget deficit might cause an increase in inflation. Uh, a fall in interest rates might cause a fall in the exchange rate, okay? Or typically causes a fall in the exchange rate. Those little hedging words just give the examiner a sense that you're on top of your game. Evaluative words. You can put these in just to, it's like, almost like um, you go into a supermarket and you can smell the bread, but you don't know where the bread is, okay? Uh, I don't know where it is, it's near the bakery, but you can smell the bread. And sometimes you put words in like, however, conversely, in practice, or oh, that famous phrase, in theory, but in practice, on balance. So little words, evaluative words, just kind of tell the examiner you're on, you know, you, you bang on it, okay? Um, not, not doing anything clever, you're just using these words in the exam. Structural words, basically, I call them architectural words. It just basically structures your answer, you know? Firstly, or my second point is, or in judgment, the final uh, final conclusion. For instance, such as hints that application. Okay, we spend a lot of time in the grade booster courses and in our live cinema sessions, just saying well, these are words that really do help in the exam. Uh, almost done. Uh, conscious of time here. Application really key in macro papers. Very very important. Hopefully, the sessions we've done in the last week have helped you. The best answers always connect theory with examples, uh, either from the data provided in the exam or from your own knowledge. Uh, examples and evidence need to be integrated into the analysis and evaluation throughout the answer. So my strong advice for tomorrow is try to include some application in every major paragraph. It doesn't have to be a lot, just be one piece of application. It doesn't have to be data. It could just be a good example. Okay. But try and build the evidence and the examples into your answers all the way through. So you're picking up those application marks. 2019, the last time the exams were run in 2019, pardon me, nearly, nearly half the application marks were not awarded by the exam boards. Students were writing great theoretical essays, but they weren't getting the application marks. Don't let that be you tomorrow. You must know the key stats on the UK economy. And our session at five o'clock tonight, the one before last, hopefully helped you. Now, you don't need to know the precise stats, but you need to know roughly what the stats are for the UK. That's really quite important. Okay, moving on. Uh, evaluation, when you're writing strong conclusions and reasoned judgments. So it does depend on the example, doesn't it? So AQA, I think the conclusions required are much longer. Uh, at Excel, they asked for a final reasoned judgment in the 25 mark question. So do come to a judgment, okay? Don't miss that final paragraph out because it does make a difference. It's a point of, it is a point of difference between students. Often it's the prioritization of impacts of, or, or policies. So uh, I think, for example, I think investment in infrastructure is really important in the long run because of the supply side effects. Whereas in the short term, I'm quite happy for fiscal policy to keep the economy out of recession, whatever. So prioritization. Briefly, once you've prioritized, justify it, ideally using a little bit of evidence. So once you've come to a, a view in your conclusion, whatever that view is, if I'm a Keynesian, happy to think there are alternative views, try and use some application to support it. Okay. And then a uh, really key point, uh, try and identify and explain two de so dependent factors. If you're using phrases like it depends on, so my conclusion depends on, that really helps uh, a, a final conclusion. The impact of a depreciation, the exchange rate depends on the elasticity of demand and supply, or it depends on the magnitude of the change, or it depends on other external factors affecting the economy. So I think maybe tomorrow or tonight, just have a little think about conclusions. Um, they don't have to be very long necessarily, but they have to be reasoned conclusions. Central stuff, last, essentially last slide. Well, thanks for your time, the team, really appreciate it. Come to a judgment, come to a judgment. Oh, sorry, next slide, last slide, Jim. sorry. You already said that. Essential stuff. 
tonight, make sure you've written down how long you have for each question in your paper tomorrow. Make sure that is written down and you know it. Okay? Remind yourself of it in the exam. Please, tomorrow, do not leave any question as blank. Do not leave any question blank. Because you're going to pick up, and the next point makes this. Uh, there were always marks for basic knowledge, application. If you just provide a definition or relevant quote from a source, you'll get some application and knowledge marks. So please, please do that. You'll definitely get some credit for that. And most importantly, most importantly tomorrow, please use the data from the extracts, the charts and tables. Especially the daily response questions, pick up those application marks. Don't let them, don't leave any application marks on the table. Well done, everybody. I've uh, got a couple of minutes. Uh, that's all for any questions and our production team will probably pick some questions uh i will do my best i by the way i don't question spot i find it very hard to make predictions really hard especially about the future rachel says can you show supply side effects even if asked about demand side policies well that could be an evaluation couldn't it rachel that uh, monetary policy has supply side effects fiscal policy has supply side effects so you could build that rachel very cleverly uh, which I think you're hinting about in your evaluation. Can you shout out Elliot Transfield? He watches all your vids and loves you so much. Well, of course we can. Elliot, a big shout out for you. Uh, if you're watching all the videos, you must be tired of my voice by now. But good luck tomorrow. Dan Piper, do you need to use specific numbers when drawing a diagram for comparative advantage or can it be implied through the position of the curves? Dan, that's a great question. My answer is you'll be fine implied through the position of the curves is fine it really is you don't need specific numbers if you're using a ppf diagram if you're using a matrix table then you wouldn't use numbers wouldn't you but no you'd be okay as long as there's a clear difference in the gradient of the ppf you're showing the relative opportunity cost and you'll be absolutely fine then i've got time for two more questions are there any general points that we should avoid jeff not quite sure what you're getting at there gabriel any general points that we should avoid um i don't understand the question uh, uh, you, you answer the paper that's put in front of you <laughs> as best you can. Um, how about how do we go about representing the job retention scheme diagrammatically? It was a wage subsidy, wasn't it? Two ways of doing this, Alec, and thank you for your question. One would be labour demand and supply, because the wage subsidy effectively should increase demand for labour or stop it falling because you're subsidising demand. I would probably use ADAS. The wage subsidy uh, reduced cost of production for firms and therefore helps to stimulate higher output because people are still in a job and still spending money. So I'd probably go to ADAS for that one. Thanks for your question, Alec, on that. VAV21, with policies to reason inequality, can you talk about intervention supply side policies? Was that too vague? Is it supposed to be? I know you can and should. But again, you have to make it specific. So I want to know which intervention is policies. We talk about welfare reform, we talk about minimum wage, we talk about universal basic income. You know, make it specific and then build that into your chain of reasoning. That would be absolutely fine. Thank you for that question. Paul O'Connor says, please can we have a gym reveal? Well, Paul, your wish may be about to come true. And there he is. Everybody give a shout out to Jim. He's my stunt double. Uh, there we go, Paul. Was that okay? And time for two more questions. Let me take two more. Can you use PPF for comparative advantage? Jay, you can, you should. I think my diagram did that. And a big shout out to Jay because I think he's come to every session. He's been a, a truly magnificent contributor to our, our group, our community, our commune has been working on. Andy, thanks for your question. Are there any countries in particular you would recommend looking at for application in case? Okay, 25 mark on develop, developing. Well, we're thinking if you add Excel, development will be paper three. But if you're looking for uh, some countries now to think about, I, will, I focus on countries like Bangladesh, Vietnam, Ethiopia, uh, India, China. And I'm just fascinated by economics. So uh, I just read every day as much as I can. Maybe choose one or two that you're interested in. Just find out a little bit about them, and then you might be able to use that in the exam. The thing is, you don't need a lot of knowledge. You just need to have a little bit, and you can you can make good use of it.
Have we got any more questions coming through? Let's take one more question, then we'll finish. Okay, and here's our last question in our series, Dan Piper. Are there any points, diagrams, evaluation, which we wouldn't get credit for? Oh, okay, Dan, thank you for this question. Really interesting, something beyond the edible spec. Let's be clear, okay, answers which are strong economics, good economics that lie beyond the spec, not expected to include them in the answer, providing they're relevant to the question, they will be credited. They may not appear on the mark scheme, and uh, there's a little bit of a risk of having an inexperienced examiner who may not understand the point you're making. So my advice, Dan, uh, Dan and to others, is not to be too clever in an exam. You will probably know more economics than the examiner. Maybe I'm being a bit... <laughs> you may well certainly know a lot more because you've, you've done a revision. Uh, so don't try to be too clever in the exam. Do what it says on the tin in the exam. Answer the question as best you can using the economics that you know will work. Of course, reading the mark schemes tonight or tomorrow will help you to get a feel for that. So don't try to be too clever. The danger is that you your answer gets lost a little bit in the in the in the ether, and, and the examiners become a bit confused and they don't give you the credit that you probably deserve. So stick to what you know works, and you'll be absolutely fine. I'm very conscious that we've taken up 40 minutes of your time. So I'm going to pause here and say good luck to everybody. Uh, we won't be, uh, well, we're going to be answering as many questions as we can tomorrow. If you want to post a question in the comment section of this video, give it a like if it's been any, been any use to you. We've done eight sessions, and I think on the website, on the YouTube website, we, we're posting quite a nice prominent link linking back to those eight sessions if you want to go through them on the macro site paper two is tomorrow just give it your best shot everybody i'm sure you'll be fine and then we'll leave it a couple of days and then we'll be back again for one more go one more push towards paper three everybody can do this you can, really can we've got some great students here who are working tremendously hard so stay happy stay positive stay focused for tomorrow get the timing right and you'll be fine take care See you soon.